I received a question by email about chapter 11, number 3. So let's talk about that a little bit. So we're going to first look at a, <clears throat> excuse me, a, a short run and long run case for uh, economic growth boosts world oil demand. Then we're going to look back at a case where there was a negative supply shock. Um, there's a Arab nation embargo on exports to Western countries in the aftermath of, um, I think it was the Six Days War, uh, Israel, um, Egypt uh, War. Um, if you observed an oil price rise, this this sort of asks us to look back at the differences in between case and number one and number two. Then we're asked to think about the differences between a competitive market and a monopoly or cartel market. Um, more on the cartel market, more on the cartel market. All right, let's plow through this problem. Sort of fun. Well, depends on how you enjoy fun. Fun for me, I guess. Uh, let's do the first case. As you know from your reading, the feature of oil markets in the short run is really steep price inelastic demand curves. People have a certain type of furnace in their home. They, um, they drive a certain distance to work. They have a certain type of car. It, you know, there's a lot of things that might change in the long run, but are sort of stuck in the short run. And likewise, uh, the way oil markets have worked, that was supposed to be a straight line, the way oil markets have worked is that you know, with, dwell, with wells, either on land or, or offshore, you know, there's a, it takes a lot of time and a lot of money to build a well. Once a, the well is built, you know, oil is gushing out and, um, you know, producers generally just pr bring it to market. Um, the, um, the, the article that was cited elsewhere in our reading talked about how fracking has a little bit of a different economics to it, that um, the lag time between um, prices rising and increasing the quantity supply is much shorter and um, that, that the fixed costs are much lower. So it's, it's an interesting read if, or, or, uh, if you haven't. That's that Spencer Dale uh, speech that, that was linked to our reading. Anyway, so there's, let's do this demand event. There's some initial um, market clearing price. These are short run functions. Uh, so there we, there we are. Um, there's a market clearing quantity. And notice that when these functions are, are so steep that any event, either on the demand side or the supply side, is going to have a pretty, pretty big uh, price effect in the short run and, and not all that big of a quantity effect in the short run. Um, all right, there's a demand increase. Let's use blue for the short run uh, demand increase. And um, what, uh, the way we model this, there's a new short run demand curve. India and China are growing, etc. Uh, this was the case. Uh, this, these were dominating events in the early 2000s, 2004, 2005. We saw a huge run up in oil prices. Um, so price goes up, quantity supplied, qu the market clearing quantity um, exchanged, you know, goes up, but not, not dramatically because of the nature of uh, the short-run supply function. All right, so, so that's the, um, that's the short-run case. Now, Long run, let's move to red. So in the long run, producers can re respond differently to supply shocks. So I'm going to write, I'm going to draw a long run supply curve that goes through that initial point. Um, and um, the, the uh, let, let's just focus on there being a different uh, long run supply curve. And in the long run, that, that change in, um, in price is going to inspire a supply response that would knock down price quite substantially and increase quantity a little bit more. Um, the, the third part of the problem asks us to say, well, hey, you know, there's a different long run um, demand curve too that, that um, would hold. Um, so let's Let's um, use green for that. And the long-run demand curve we're going to look at is, is the new demand curve. So, so those, that growth would shift both the short-run demand and the long-run demand. There's already a lot of curves going around. I'm just going to um, show the new um, long-run demand curve. There'd be, a, there'd be an old long-run demand curve, you know, somewhere 
like that. Uh, okay, well, what's this going to do? The, as consumers um, uh, adjust to um, Uh, but let's. I, I drew it through this point. As consumers adjust to that high price, they're gonna they're gonna find you know they're gonna move closer to work or or they're gonna when they switch jobs they're gonna get a job closer to their home. They're they're gonna sell their Hummer and and buy a Prius instead. You know all these if if they had a gas furnace, oil burning sorry oil burning uh, furnace uh, those used to be common before the rises in, in the price of oil in the seventies, but. Um, the, uh, they, they would change it out for a natural gas furnace. Um, it, anyway, there's a lot of ways to adjust in the long run. So the, the combination of the long run responsivity by both um, buyers and sellers is going to have the market clear at something more like P2 and Q, sorry, P3 and Q3, where notice the, both the supply and the response has been much more vigorous and the, the price effect associated with that demand increase has, has moderated. Uh, so that's, that's the first part of this problem. Um, a negative supply shock, let's go through that case. I'm looking at the clock here, see how much time I have left in the screencast. Um, try to keep it under 10 minutes. All right, so now let's do this demand shock, sort of a, sorry, a supply shock. This is the 70s oil embargo. Um, dollars per barrel um, that's the unit um, that, that um, world oil barrels like 30 gallons um, million barrels per year and we have again an initial short run um, supply curve very steep initial sh short run um, demand curve also very steep Talking and writing at the same time have never has never been my forte, and there's some market clearing initial price, some market clearing initial quantity. All right, so now this embargo comes along, and in the short run, the um, price rises quite dramatically. Quantity, so uh, Q1. So price goes up. All right, so that's the short run case. Um, and then uh, in, in the long run, though, uh, let's, th let's think about uh, there being a long run supply response. Um, I guess the long run supply we draw like that, let's just draw the new long run supply. Because the embargo took, you know, some of the Middle Eastern countries out of the game, but there still was, you know, there's still a lot of supply in the U.S. came online, Oklahoma, Alaska, uh, Texas oil, uh, more expensive to get out of the ground than the Middle Eastern oil, but with, with the rise in price, it became economical to do so. Uh, and then let's just look at the, the demand curve, the initial long run demand curve. And what we see is that um, over time, the, the quantity effect would be much bigger and the price effect would be much smaller because those long-run functions are, are more elastic. And this is indeed what happened over the 70s. Um, since the 70s, the uh, real dollar value of GDP per bar barrel of oil has gotten uh, much higher, so people use less oil for any any unit of economic activity. Um, you know, there's no more oil furnaces around. Um, there's more fuel efficient cars, although that 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 that, that was a big thing in the late '70s. Um, but but now we see a lot of SUVs on the road that because the oil prices prices came down uh, quite quite far uh, in the in after the 1970s. Uh, all right, let's uh, let's go on with this problem. Um, let's think about just briefly how this problem would look different if we had a, a single monopoly producer. In that case, there would be this world oil demand, 
and there'd be this industry marginal cost. We wouldn't talk about a supply curve. We'd talk about industry marginal costs. There'd be some marginal revenue function associated. I didn't draw that very well, but um, let's just go with that. There'd be some marginal revenue function, and the, the marginal revenue equals marginal cost. There'd be this high price and lower quantity than would prevail in uh, the competitive outcome. QM versus, we'll call it QC and PC. And remember, there'd be some isoprofit line uh, that would describe that's supposed to be a tangency. Call it. Uh, there, there'd be some isoprofit line that this monopoly, monopolist would reach. Um, the competitive market composed of many sellers, that supply and demand intersect. Uh, if there's just a single monopolist, there'd be a price higher than marginal cost and a quantity lower than the competitive outcome. And that, that actually would also be the, the out, outcome if, if a, a cartel were successful at uniting all producers into a single monolithic entity to, to maximize aggregate profits. Um, the problem with a cartel is, is that it's inherently unstable. If I'm Libya, say, and a member of OPEC, and I, there's this high world oil price, you know, if I, if I produce a little more than my quota, I'm going to capture that high price. I'm, I'm small relative to world oil supply. Um, Saudi Arabia is huge. They're holding the line. I can take advantage of that by chiseling. But the problem is everybody in a cartel thinks like that, and suddenly um, we're at the competitive outcome. So, so um, that's, that's the source of that inherent instability of cartels. Um, it, when there's non-OPEC producers, uh, it's, a, it's a little bit different. Um, the the non-OPEC producers are, are competitive, and so the, the market, they would push... The, the market price down to, um, to where marginal cost and price are, are equalized. Um, the, the actions of OPEC can still be effective, though, because OPEC uh, has as its members uh, most of the low-cost uh, the low cost producing countries, so, so Middle Eastern oil is much easier to get out of the ground and much easier to refine, so that um, by, by uh, restricting that, uh, the supply of that low-cost uh, oil, the, the OPEC can let the fringe producers produce and, and their marginal costs are high enough that OPEC still does pretty well letting the market clear at the marginal costs of the non-OPEC producing countries. That's, that's the way it works. That's a little bit complex to graph. Um, well, I guess you'd, you'd realize you could think, think it through in this graph just by realizing that these are the OPEC producers down here and these are the... Um, other producers up here, U.S. Um, frackers, U.S. frackers, um, Mexico, I think, is a little bit higher cost oil, etc. Although Mexico is a member of, they're, they're a, got a weird status. They're like an auxiliary member of OPEC. All right, I think that's enough for this one.